So if um, anyone have anyone questions, come up to the microphones over here. The microphones over here, and there are microphones over there on that side. Thank you so much for coming and showing. Uh, Justified it was really, really awesome. Um, my question is, what do you look for when you're interviewing someone for staff writer? And I'd also direct that to Wendy on, on your first staff writing meeting, how interview any tidbits or uh, uh, little experiences you'd like to share. Thanks. Um, I'll start. Uh, first of all, I look for cash. Um, <laughs> Not above a bribe. Uh, I totally missed that. What was it? Cash. I like money. Uh, no, I. This she, is. Being she got excited because she got a, an autographed picture of Erica Tazel. Oh, well, that is cool. <laughs> um, you know, everything. Everything's based on 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 writing, and so many times uh, I've. You don't know by the name you know, what ethnicity the person is, and, and it's just, do I like the script? Do I like the writing? Is this a voice that fits with this show? Um, I, I, I didn't have any idea, I don't think you were African American when, when I hired you on Reigns. I just read your stuff and went, oh, this is a great voice. You know, this, this would be great for this show. And, uh, and then I met you and, you know, the rest is history. Wow. What, what was the script that um, you read I of think, yours? I think, I think I had a nip tuck. Oh. I was writing FX before I was at FX. <laughs> the Nip Tuck did me very well, by the way. I like wrote to read it. Your Nip Tuck. Yeah, I wrote it after the first season. I remember turning it into my manager, and he had not even heard of the show. And he said, "What is that? Why are you? What? What are you writing? You know? Why don't you write something network? Why are you writing Nip Tuck?" And that show stayed around for several years, and that that spec served me well for many years. I was really happy with that. Um, let's see the. I'm trying to remember the question now. What, what was it like coming in to meet to get the staffing ah, job? Yes, I um, on on Reigns, which was the first staff writing job I got. And by the way, just so you know, it was a five-year process. I had been meeting on staff writing jobs for five years, and I was already working in the industry in reality and documentaries um, before I actually got staffed. And I met with a man named Peter Noah. And I remember saying to Peter, because Peter's resume is West Wing and it is long and I grew up watching a lot of his shows, I remember sitting across from him at a coffee shop and saying, there is nothing I could say that could impress you. <laughs> I, mean, I really, because I was so impressed with him. I just thought the world of him. And I went in very humble and I, you know, after five years of no, I'd been beaten up already. <laughs> you know, it was like, I, I was at a point, I think, where I, um, I was really detached from getting the job. I went in and I was just having fun and I really enjoyed meeting Peter and I think I was able to be my normal self and maybe that's something that he clued into. Um, because before then, I was always kind of hungry and eager and I really, really wanted it, you know? And I think people can smell that when you go in on those interviews. Like, they know you're desperate, right? And I had given up, really. I was on Hell's Kitchen, I was co-producing, I, I felt I was already on my way. If I got the job, great. If I didn't, oh well. You know, and I think that attitude helped me, actually. I would say, uh, besides, besides giving up, um, one other thing that I... <laughs> Which is great advice, actually, it really is. <laughs> Which is be yourself. But um, in Graham, you might disagree with me on this. But something I tend to look for in terms of staff writers is 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 some kind of being people who are slightly prolific. You know, oftentimes you'll read a sample from a writer and it's really intriguing and interesting, and you'll say, well, it's to their agent or whomever, like, is there what else can I read? And when I hear there's nothing else, there's sort of this feeling of. Uh oh, this is going to be a writer's room. You're going to have to be writing a lot and coming up with a lot of ideas. If there's one script you've written and that's that's the only thing that's come out of you in 10 years, that can be a little nerve wracking. So it's uh, you know something that that I know we look for is additional samples. So something to have in mind. Uh, here. Hi. <clears throat> Uh, I just want to say, Graham, I love Speed. It's awesome. Uh, it still is one of my family's favorite movies. Uh, this question is actually for the writers. Uh, it's about the Cosby Show edition at the end of that episode, which I thought was really awesome. I was wondering uh, who came up with it and uh, what was, why, why did you include it? I sort of know why, I just want to hear you discuss it. And Erica, how did you feel when you were reading it and if that affects you at all in your decisions in this episode? I, I'm, I'm to blame for that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the Cosby Show, 
it was such a, a, an impact on my life. Um, it, I watched it religiously, as I think a lot of black people did, and um, I always compared my family to theirs, and why weren't we rich Huxtables, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I guess I just got sucked into that fantasy, and as I was thinking about what was the fantasy Rachel probably had, I thought, well, it's probably pretty close to the fantasy I did, which was, you know, I thought our family was the Cosbys, um, just because that is, it's so iconic in, um, in black family life. For me, it was, again, a clue. And um, since that episode and, and the inclusion of that television family, it, it, I often ask the question, what's real and what's fantasy for Rachel? And how much she deals in fantasy to deal with the reality of her situation? Um, and it's, it's something that I, I think I will be exploring internally about the character as she navigates the world of being a US Marshal um, and the decision to choose that as a profession, but the realities of that versus what she thought it would, it would be which was a good job with benefits. Yeah. So. Um, this question, well, thank you all for being here, by the way. Um, this question is for uh, Graham and Wendy, I guess, really. You guys both spoke earlier about um, writing colorblind and whatnot and writing to the character if they do happen to be African-American. When you are writing toward being African-American a character, how do you avoid going to a stereotypical place with that person while keeping it authentic or writing to that character being black, I guess is my question. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good question because I am, you know, a guy who grew up in Toronto. And, um, <laughs> but I think that part of that is growing up outside of the United States, everyone south of the 49th parallel is foreign to me. Um, <laughs> you spell color and neighbor weird. Um, <laughs> you say sorry instead of sorry the way the good Lord intended it. Um, so, but I, the other thought I had is that, um, you know, one of the things in Elmore's world, and, and I think this is why, and this is patting myself on the back, not really, but I, it's, it's that I, I think I was a good fit to adapt his, his short story, which is, um, and I, I don't think my writing was always this way, I think it has developed over the years, but trying to give every character the benefit of the doubt and trying to treat every character with respect and like them. Now, Elmore likes all of his characters. He said in all the years he's written one character he didn't like. He was a real bad guy. And, but everyone else, there's something about them. Even if they're a horrible murderer, hitman, there's something interesting about them that he can, he can use to humanize them. And so, um, you know, you can approach that, it, that sort of attitude to every character, every culture, every ethnicity. It's sort of, who is that person? Can I make that person a three-dimensional living, breathing character um, with the few brush strokes you have. So, uh, and that, you know, a lot, it, it, it's, it's imagination for, for me to write any character outside of myself. So whether it's black, Chicano, w woman, a anything, it's, it's an imagination um, exercise. And you just hope that, you know, you do it intelligently and um, don't slip into stereotypes. And I think that there, the thing is that there is a minefield in that there are stereotypes that I'm unaware of. And so, just as if someone was you know, writing a Canadian character and they're always, hey, take off, eh? Hey. Oh yeah, let's get a donut. <laughs> um, which I would find incredibly offensive. Um, <laughs> unless, unless I could make money off of it. But um, <laughs> that, that um, you know, and, and that's why it's important to, you know, have writers of various ethnicities and the cast. And one of the things in this show is, uh, you know, we're doing a Southern set show. And so a big concern of ours is, are we lapsing into Southern stereotypes? And when we were down in Kentucky, someone said, we're so happy you don't have any characters saying y'all. And then they would say, come on, y'all. And, you know, <laughs> and they just didn't want to hear it. Just like I have Canadian friends who do say A, hey, but um, they don't want to hear that. Um, so, Luckily on the cast, we've got Nick Searcy, we've got Joel, we've got Walton, um, who all grew up in the South. Um, and so they, they helped sort of police that for us as well. 
I, I try to, um, I, I'm just really inspired by real reality and real people, and so I try to talk to as many people as I can. Um, I'm usually the writer that's on the phone with the marshals all the time, just to listen to them talk. Um, and so that helps me with the stereotypes. And also I agree, just try to um, really have respect for the character and love the character and, and get to know the character enough that they actually start to speak to you. I know that sounds a little odd, but there, there, is, there is that moment where you cross the line, you're no longer forcing that character to be, it's starting to develop into its own organic thing. I, I remember in, when I first read the first draft of this script and we, we talked about the, uh, the halfway house, the sort of uh, sobriety program thing and Olander and, and his stuff. And, you know, the reality of that and the way you just flowed with that character and how he was talking, I'm the Stairmaster, you know, I work all 12 steps several times a day and all this stuff. And it was just like, holy crap, you know? Have you, um, and it just felt true, and uh, and that's the thing you're, I guess, always going for. Now, maybe there's someone who runs a halfway house who goes, oh, that's just such a caricature. You know, that's such a stereotype, but eh. Oh, I just had, <laughs> I had so much fun writing that scene. That scene was just wrong on so many levels that I just loved it. I just had a blast, and I thought to myself when I turned in the draft, he's either going to really like this or he's going to hate it. So, um, but sometimes that's the line you kind of need to get right up to. To, to really do something different. And, and we knew with that character that at the end that he was going to go to actually try to save Clinton because this is what he believed. And, and that was a nice turn. And that's, that's, you know, I think that's what you aim for in any show, and in particular in, in our Elmore world, where, oh, you find out something else about someone later on. You know, the word that we often use at FX, like the, the highest compliment you could pay a, a script or show, which is one we use often on the show, is um, specificity. And I think that's something that you, you see here, which is there there's small details and, and sort of accuracy, uh, accurate reflections of, of real characters that they kind of move away from the stereotype because they are so specific, you know, and then that's what. A writing question. Um, uh, Elmore Leonard has a really distinctive writing style. Uh, it's part of why he's such a big popular writer of novels. Are you conscious of trying to ape that when you're working on the show, or do you sort of go read it, remember it, and then forget it and just write? Um, because I did the pilot, which was taking his, his novella, Fire in the Hole, and I always start to say short story, and then I remember that Elmore's researcher, Greg Sutter, is in the audience tonight, and Elmore insists that it's a novella, not a short story. Uh -huh. So. Um, there were, there were points when I was adapting it where literally I'd be thinking, okay, what's Raylan gonna say next? And I would stop and go, well, what did Elmore have him say next? And I'll just use that line. And so for me, there was this interesting exercise of literally retyping Elmore Leonard and condensing and moving stuff around. And I really got a sense of what it was. I, I, it was I, it's not an exercise that I could say, oh, everyone in a writing school should do this or whatever, but it was, it helped me. It, it sort of gave me a sense of the flow, you know, what it was like to type those words in that order and on the page um, or on the computer screen. But I think in general, we in, in the writer's room, I, I think your last, you know, you, you read it, you, you, were, you know, be lot, register it and then try to forget it and try to do more of the style and it's the attitude that he has more than anything. The attitude and the fact that he he likes to be very specific and he'll mention product names and he'll um, you know reference popular culture and so there are things like that that we try to try to do. Yeah, I, I mean I, I agree. I just I would read the work and then set it aside and then let the story that we were working on come through its own way, you know. Um, I think it'd be really difficult to try to put on the Elmore Leonard hat every time you tried to sit down to write. It's pretty intimidating, well, too. You guys do it pretty well. That's why I asked. It does feel kind of like his work when you, when you watch Well, you know, everyone, on, uh, everyone in that room and, uh, you know, a lot of people on the show just love his stuff. And so, you know, we are fans. I always, you know, I, I look at some of the mov movies that have been made of his material and I just get the sense that some of them weren't made by fans, you know, whereas Out of Sight and Get Shorty, um, you know, Scott Frank is a big fan of Elmore. And so we all are, too. And I think hopefully that that shows. <laughs>